significado, lo más preciado que puede tener una madre ¿eh? o su hijo. Angustia porque no sabemos si están enfermos, si tienen frío, si tienen hambre. Que este evento sea realmente una contribución para firmar la paz. Just wish you all good luck in, in, the, in the football. Argentina 3, Holanda 1. Una sala de cinco meses cuando se la llevaron. Mi nieto tiene que haber nacido en agosto del año pasado. Hasta ahora no he podido saber nada de él. against violators of human rights, a life sentence for 85-year-old Jorge Rafael Videla. This is a story that I've been holding on to for a while now. Not because I don't want to talk about it, but more because I wanted to learn as much as I can to kind of digest it all. It almost feels ironic that someone born in Argentina and grew up in the United States is telling this story. But it's almost fitting given that this event in history has so many twists and turns and unexpected routes. This is so much more than just looking into a shading tournament and organization. I could talk about a certain World Cup that was bad and that's it, but alongside it, to truly understand what happened, we have to get into the country that was hosting it. First, before I even do that, I just wanted to say thank you to all the new subscribers. We got a huge boost recently and uh, you guys are really just making my dream come true. So again, thank you. What we will unravel today involves murder, disappearances, corruption, government dealings, wars, dictators, and the world's greatest tournament. This is the 1978 FIFA World Cup Uncloaked. Let's go back to Argentina in the 1950s. Meet Juan Perón, who was a general turned politician and had a lot of popularity in Argentina. So popular that this man went up the ladder to be the Minister of Labor to Vice President and eventually President of Argentina three times. It's all pretty complicated, but... First, he was president from 1946 to 1952. He was trying to stay out of the Cold War between the US and Russia, but at the same time, he got real close to the Russians and even opened up a grain sale route directly to Russia. The US did not like that and started placing embargoes on Argentina to try to keep them away from joining some type of communist movement. At the same time, Juan's wife, Eva was loved by the people. Eva became a huge part of Juan's political movement because of just how much the public adored her. You know, don't cry for me, Argentina, a bop. She made the working unions join their movement because she knew how hard life was for the working class. But in 1952, Eva passed away of cancer and the world around Juan was becoming a little shaky. The unions that supported Perón were starting to turn on him. Juan would force over 2,000 people to be fired for opposing his views. His five-year plan on helping grow the country's economy was failing. Side note, the dude was also not a good dude. Perón was basically the main figure on Argentina being a safe haven for Nazis after World War II. President Juan Domingo Perón was more than ready to welcome those former Axis members with open arms. President Perón was an admirer of the German ideology of that time. He helped numerous war criminals to flee with the support of his own diplomats and intelligence agents deployed in Europe. Argentines supported ways for their transit through passages from Italy and Spain to Buenos Aires. Some of the biggest names in the Nazi regime were found in Argentina, and many more were never found and lived to be old men without facing their crimes. Side side note, it's kind of ironic that that's the fact, because the Jewish community 
is the third largest immigrant group in Argentina, behind the Spanish in second and Italians in first with 62% of modern Argentinians being of Italian descent. The largest Jewish community in South America is in Argentina, the sixth largest in the world. And meanwhile, Perón and his dweebs are inviting Nazi war criminals in to build their own cities in the middle of nowhere. Bariloche is essentially an Austrian German Alpine resort in Argentina. For many Germans and Austrians, Bariloche was a real home from home. The lakes were there, the mountains were there, the Germans were there, and a lot of them were Nazis. Anyways, fast forward. In Perón's second term, a military regime took over the country and kicked Perón out of Argentina. Then he was kind of homies with Che Guevara and escaped to Spain and lived there for a while. Then, not surprisingly, the military rule fell apart. Perón came back and was re-elected as their president. Perón got a little older, he suffered several heart attacks, and eventually, before his third term ended, passed away in 1974. Now, Perón's wife, not, not Eva, she's dead, remember? It, it, new wife, Isabel, was at the time the vice president and then became president. It's Argentina, I don't know. She held the presidency up until 1976 when a military coup backed by the United States took over the country. And that's where our story gets really dark. Say hello to Jorge Rafael Videla. Jorge was an Argentine sick military freak who believed that the country should be completely ruled by the military. Videla was promoted to Brigade General in 1971 and then later rose the ranks to become the head of Joint Chiefs of Staff of the Argentine Armed Forces in 1975. When President Perón died and his wife took over, Jorge had a plan in place, backed by the United States, to take over. At the end of her speech, Isabel Perón asked the crowd to leave quietly and wave them goodbye. On the sidelines, watching, listening, prepared, the army. Knowing that when Isabel is finally dislodged, they will surely inherit a crumbling economy, worsening civil disorder, and the ruins of a political dream, Peronism. At the time, the United States was dealing with a pretty scary Cold War with Russia. And the US government had its eyes on its neighbors especially its neighbors to the south. Also, the US saw civil unrest and terrorism as a threat from other countries even to itself. So it didn't like the way Argentina was running things at the time. And Henry Kissinger, the demon himself, was at the time the Secretary of State and was in full support of Videla and his men. In fact, in newly released documents, Kissinger applauded Videla's government and met with Videla several times. Look. Henry should have his own whole damn video. The, the dude is disgusting, but we're not done with Henry. You'll see him again. So how bad was Videla's presidency? Could be too bad, no? Oh, it was bad, real bad. The military rule is known as the Dirty War, a war between a military government and its people. Videla and his goons acted upon some of the worst human rights violations in all of the Americas in modern times. He once said, a terrorist is not just someone with a gun or a bomb, but also someone who spreads ideas that are in contrary to the Western and Christian civilization. Okay. The military junta attacked anyone who went against the government. Anyone who was seen as a threat would be kidnapped and disappeared. Thousands of kidnappings, assassinations, tortures, and other horrific acts took place under Jorge. Thousands of students in colleges were taken never to be seen again. From 1976 to 1977, Videla narrowly escaped three assassinations. Civil war-like warfare took place between the military and leftist guerrillas. It was a madhouse. Thousands of victims were drugged, loaded into military aircraft, and thrown out of the Rio de la Plata and the Atlantic Ocean to drown. The flights are known today as the death flights. B-52 
between 10,000 to 12,000 victims were placed in detention camps and some later were released. And it keeps getting worse. Some of the taken women were pregnant or became pregnant in capture and some hoped that they would be let go because you know, they are pregnant. But most of the time, they never were. Most of the mothers would be likely killed after giving birth and the newborns would be illegally adopted to military families. And we're gonna touch back to that horror, but we gotta keep going. While all of that is happening, the biggest tournament in the world is just around the corner. So we don't have to get into how FIFA is a straight up corrupt organization. We've done it in two other videos, go check them out. But unfortunately, the corruption ran deep within its foundations and it was very present in 1978. On July 6th, 1966, FIFA selected Argentina to host the 1978 World Cup. Famously, our boy Juan Perón, who was president at the time, celebrated and saluted the crowd with his arms up in the air, which inspired the 1978 World Cup logo. Funny thing is, the logo was created in 1974, two years before Videla took over. Once Videla did take over, he wanted to change the logo, but it was so widely commercialized that he would force thousands of lawsuits from FIFA and merchandise companies so they decided to just keep it the same. And then the World Cup finally arrived in June of 1978. Remember, at this exact moment, people are going missing, being grabbed out of the streets to be dumped in the middle of the ocean or into a river, never to be seen again. Children were being kidnapped and adopted to right-wing military families. But let's play some footy ball. The format in the early years of the tournament was so weird in 1978, the World Cup had 16 teams, split between four groups of four. The top two teams would move on to the second round, but the second round consisted of the teams that qualified split into two groups of four, and the two teams with the most points slash goals would move on to the final. The second place finishers would go on to play each other for a third place spot. Okay, it's weird, but it's the 70s, man. A lot of weird shit is happening, so let's just move on. Now in the rounds, there were several surprises. One of them being Peru taking first place in their group above the Netherlands. Peru had a pretty nasty team at the time, and beating a team like the Netherlands was a shocker, but Peru was kind of like that dark horse in the tournament. We'll get back to them. The other huge surprise was Austria finishing ahead of Brazil in the group. Brazil, a team that has won three World Cups by this time. But that was it for the first round. Let's move on to the second round. This is where I need you guys to put on your conspiracy caps because it gets a little wild here. Group A had all European teams. The Netherlands and Italy fought it off in their final game in the group to see who would reach the World Cup final. With 15 minutes remaining, the score at 1-1, Ari Haan scored to put the Netherlands into the final. Cool, fun, nothing weird there. Let's go to the other group. This group was a battle between Brazil and the host Argentina. When they played each other, it was a brutal match, but it actually ended nil-nil. So, the final games in the group could be decided by goal difference. Brazil beat Poland 3-1, meaning Argentina not only had to beat Peru in the final game, but they had to beat them by four goals to leap over Brazil in the standings and go to the final. Welcome to game day. On June 21st, 1978, Argentina and Peru faced off in Rosario in what would be one of the most controversial games in FIFA history. And that says a lot when it comes to FIFA. You remember our good friend Kissinger, you know, the guy who backed this whole military regime? Um, do you want to know where he's at right now? Take a guess. Kissinger was chilling with dictator Videla throughout the entire tournament. They both were traveling around the country together, attending matches, having meals together, just a true bromance. And on that night in June, 30 minutes before the big game, while Peru was giving its pre-game talks in the locker room, Jorge Videla and Henry Kissinger walk in accompanied by military guards. First-hand witnesses state that Videla said, Gentlemen, I just wanted to tell you that this game tonight 
is one between brothers. And in the name of Latin American Brotherhood, I am here to share my hopes that things turn out well. Latin America is watching you. He then read a letter from Peru's dictator at the time that covered cooperation between the two countries. Videla and Kissinger then left the locker room for their seats. This was the first and only time Videla visited a team's locker room. The first half of the match ended 2-0, which still wasn't enough for Argentina to reach the final. But after an all-out collapse, Argentina finished off Peru 6-0 to reach the World Cup Finals, with Videla and his boyfriend celebrating in the crowd. No, I just wish you all good luck in, in, the, in the football. With the results of that must-win game against Peru by now allegedly fixed, it was a priceless PR coup. The final was set on June 25th, 1978, in Estadio Monumental between Argentina and the Netherlands. The top goal scorer Mario Kempes scored the opener and within the last few minutes of the match, Holland equalized, sending the game to extra time. In extra time, Bertoni and Kempes scored the winning goals, finishing the game 3-1 and giving Argentina its first ever World Cup. Argentina three, So after the World Cup, Videla was getting older, he would relinquish his power to another sick freak named Roberto Viola in 1982. After the war against England for the Malvinas ended, Argentina's dictatorship collapsed. The new setup government put the military leaders to trial and sentenced Videla to life imprisonment. But in 1990, President Menem let Jorge and his goons out of prison with a presidential pardon. Jesus. Christ. Videla went back to prison in 1998 when a judge found him guilty for kidnapping babies. Oh, you know, just kidnapping babies, you know, just one of the things he did. He was in prison for 38 days and then transferred to house arrest. In 2012, Videla was then sentenced again by the Supreme Court to 50 years in prison for his kidnappings, murder, and military scheme. La pena de prisión Still, while this may be a day of celebrations for human rights advocates, they're very aware that time is running out. There are still some 800 other alleged rights violators awaiting trial. Finally, in 2013, the demon himself died in prison of natural causes. It is said that over 400 babies were taken, with most of their mothers murdered, and in 2019, after widespread DNA evidence, 130 of those missing children were reunited with their families and restored their identities. The best known Argentina human rights organization, the Mothers of Plaza de Mayo, for over 30 years, march to spread awareness to the thousands and thousands of missing children who most of which were thrown out to sea. Again, the estimated total killings during the dirty war is up to 30,000 and the effects are still felt today. Some of the children who were kidnapped are now in their 40s and have no idea that their family aren't really their family. This is more than just a football controversy. This is an era in South America that still have repercussions today. The United States never had to deal with its repercussions for backing the coup. They backed several military dictators in all of South America, and for what? In 1976, the US granted the Argentine military with $50 million for its fight against its own people. Then. Less than a year later, $30 million more in military aid, and the following year, $65 million. Back to the match against Peru, Peruvian Senator Ledesma stated that Jorge Videla accepted to take 13 Peruvian prisoners in the so-called Condor Plan to torture them and force them into false confessions for the Peruvian government. In return, to give Argentina that big W against Peru. The Argentine players of the 1978 World Cup had no knowledge of any deals. They've never been found with any evidence of the fixing, and most of them came out and said, I hope it's not true, we were just playing football. It's all a pretty sad story. 1978 was not that long ago. <laughs> my mom was pregnant with my older sister in 1978 in Argentina. 
And this wasn't FIFA's first or last scandal. Some of the reports have been said to be not true regarding the fixing. A lot of this is eyewitness testimony. Some Peruvian players even deny this entirely. But it's kind of hard to know who to trust. The Peruvian goalkeeper was also born in Argentina, so thoughts are that he had something to do with it. But if anyone knows football, you can never only blame the keeper. It kind of depends if you want to look back at the uh, footage. Some of the goals are pretty ugly and hard to stop, so it's hard to believe that one. Look, it's all shady to say the least. And this time in history should not be forgotten, especially for the victims. Some Americans might not even know that this even happened. And that's kind of why I wanted to talk about this. It really makes us all think hard about everything we watch, everything we support or learn about, because there's always another story. But I wanted to make this clear. I am proud to be Argentinian. I'm proud to be American. But for f sake, man, you are making this very hard history. Thank you guys for watching. I know it took forever, but trust me, it took me this long to make this video for so many damn reasons. Thank you guys for checking out uh, our TikTok. Thank you guys for checking out our other soccer channels. I have an Argentina watch along channel and a Sporting Kansas City watch along channel. Check it out if you haven't, link in the description. Thank you guys again, and I'll see you guys in the next one.